Good morning. The Center for Integrative Environmental Health Sciences and Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology welcomes you to our Environmental Health Sciences series seminar. Our speaker for today is Dr. Gregory Barnes. He is the um, inaugural permanent director of the University of Louisville Autism Center and Northern Children's Autism Center. He also hosts the Backboard Ackley Chair for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and is a tenure professor in the Department of Neurology and Pediatrics. He is board certified in pediatric neurology and epilepsy. His research focuses on potential genetic outcomes influence into the neurology, into the development of ASD and epilepsy, and how these factors contribute to outcomes and development and potential new treatments. Previously, Dr. Barnes has held academic um, positions at different institutions, to, um, to name a few, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Harvard Medical School, and Duke University Medical School. He has authored or published, co-authored 114 research articles slash book chapters in the fields of neurology, autism, epilepsy, and neurotoxicology. More importantly, Dr. Barnes serves as the Developmental Neurotoxicology Research Interest Group Leader in DCI-EHS. He now serves as PI or co-PI of multiple grants, including national multiple site grants to one, understand the role of cannabinoid signaling and genomics in autism. Two, understand the role of robot treatments in autism. And three, train providers in autism and neurodevelopmental disabilities. More recently, Dr. Barnes and his collaborators at the UFL Speed School of Engineering and have developed and tested an artificial intelligence program to diagnose autism through MRI and exam discrete neural circuits in individual brains. Today, Dr. Barnes is going to present impact of metal exposure and cerebellar neural inflammation on cognitive circuits in neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, welcome Dr. Barnes. Thank you, Jen, for that very kind introduction. So um, I'm very honored to, again to be able to talk to uh, this group and in particular the members of CIEHS. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to collaborate with you guys and do research and publish. And so I'd like to um, go over today a little bit of our more recent work um, that we've been doing on neuroinflammation and the environment. So this is a, a slide that I always show, and um, this is sort of how we think about developmental disorders. Um, we know that over on over on the left here that uh, our genomics influence the uh, expression of proteins uh, both along the axon, axon as well as in the synapse. And that leads to here in the middle uh, difficulties with connecting Activity in the brain, particularly connectivity, long range connectivity between different brain regions. And so, um, but those are influenced by not only genetic variation, but also epigenetic events that um, may or may not uh, be influenced by the environment as well as stochastic events. And that eventually leads to uh, a, a developmental behavioral profile that is uh, denoted over here with time. The, um, and these different lines represent, say, um, the uh, social behavior or uh, reward slash repetitive behaviors or uh, communication, for instance. And you end up in, in, in pediatrics, we end up in these, uh, end up in these circles that may uh, lead to uh, developmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorder. So ASD itself is a group of uh, heterogeneous uh, and particularly genetically heterogeneous neurodevelopmental disorders um, defined by these deficits in social communications and interactions as well as uh, repetitive behaviors. 
It has a wide variety of other difficulties associated with it, uh, including uh, epilepsy, which I, I am particularly an expert in. But there's also these things that include altered immune responses and metabolic disorders. And I'm going to uh, talk about that uh, quite a bit today. Uh, one of the incredibly alarming things about uh, the appearance of autism in the United States as well as in other countries is there is this exponential growth of cases uh, and it now actually represents not one in 54 but actually one in 44. And that can not only, it, it's not only uh, thought to be heritability but we are wondering whether um, and particularly environmental risk factors uh, may uh, actually uh, cause or at least promote the uh, and, and the increasing appearance of autism. Um, some of that is certainly explained by better diagnostics that we have, um, but this area here of environmental slash non-genetic risk is something that we really want to look at in the coming years. And it's something that, of course, uh, we can intervene in. All right, so in order to understand um, the development disorders and, and the processes that we'll be looking at today in our research, I just wanted to go over again um, the development of neural circuits. Um, so in the mouse, uh, neurogenesis starts at somewhere around E9 to E11, and we have these processes which include migration, synaptogenesis, and apoptosis that all the way occur through postnatal birth, and that is true also in, also in humans. Um, what is not shown on here is that the development of the uh, of angiogenesis and and uh, as a result, the development of blood brain barrier occurs all along this pathway here. And we're going to be talking about that today in, in somewhat detail. Now, uh, concomitant with that, um, the brain and during development has synchronized activity that is really important in developing both short range as well as long range synaptic connections. But if you have uh, any urine inflection, infections, inflammation, drug exposure, hypoxic ischemic, um, that can lead to uh, asynchronous or reduced activity. And, a and as a result, you can get either persistent neurons or loss of neurons uh, that will cause uh, cortical miswiring. And that is particularly true with the GABAergic circuitry, which is responsible for uh, essentially synchronizing circuits. Uh, it, and um, it is also responsible for the major problem that you have in the synapse and developmental disorders, i.e. Uh, synaptic plasticity, which um, increases uh, during childhood. Uh, and this is uh, the time that we as clinical uh, folks try to intervene with interventions. Um, but plasticity goes down as childhood goes on, particularly after ages six to eight. And we lose that plasticity window to uh, be able to ameliorate some of these uh, synaptic deficits that might occur, particularly in the synchronization and or synaptogenesis of GABAergic uh, interneurons. So um, as, a result of, as a result of all of these different factors that are uh, influent that um, are influenced by a number of different things. Um, you have a change in 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 uh, the window of these plasticities, and and plasticity actually comes at particular ages, and it's area specific. So um, that's why even in humans, um, the uh, windows close for uh, intervening in the auditory cortex or intervening in the visual cortex. And this is highly correlated with the uh, maturation and synaptic physiology in the uh, GABAergic cells.
So as a result, you have disturbed cognitive networks. Our cognitive networks come in three different flavors. First is our basic networks in, in which there are single unitary uh, processes that occur both in the uh, sensory cortex as well as in the motor cortex. Then you have these higher level slash secondary networks that are our common cognitive networks that we investigate, for instance, in fMRI uh, imaging. And these are things that include working memory, language, semantics, motion, social cognition, attention. And these are some of the basic deficits that you find in, uh, in, in developmental disorders. And uh, as you go up in uh, uh, essentially the complexity of cognitive circuits, you have increase, increasing functional neuroplasticity that does occur, thank God. And <laughs> so as a result, we actually will have some windows that will um, allow us to do intervention. Uh, but you also introduce variability, and that um, is something that um, as a, a as a result of trying to and uh, trying to do research introduces a a um, type of unknown that uh, makes this area a little harder to do research in so the bottom line i want to communicate from our introduction uh, the normal brain formation is dependent upon activity dependent and activity independent processes uh, neural circuitry comes in these three flavors that we just talked about, low-level circuits, uh, secondary highly distributed networks that we commonly uh, investigate on fMRI. And then there, there's these transient, quote-unquote, meta-networks, which is essentially networks of these, uh, of these secondary networks that mediate complex goal-directed flexible behaviors and cognition. So if you have defects in the secondary level, then obviously you're going to have defects in these metal in the behavior that's mediated by these uh, meta networks. So uh, and all of that is really uh, is really related to our circuit synchronization as well as the critical periods um, that are dependent upon uh, GABAergic cell function. <clears throat> the cell function is number one, it's energy dependent, two, it's circadian dependent, three, it's transcriptionally dependent, and four, it's experience dependent. And of course, uh, those who have done research in this area all know that um, there are environmental factors that can impact each one of those. So what are the mechanisms of the environmental factors and neuroanatomical localizations that influence our abnormal cognitive circuitry and development disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders? So today I wanna to talk about a really exciting and emerging area. And that is what is the, what is the influence of vascular neurobiology on the uh, development of the cortex and as a result on cognitive neurocircuitry. So one, um, there is new evidence, um, and this comes from uh, that neurovascular signaling may control GABAergic neurogenesis and differentiation. Um, this is an emerging area in uh, developmental neurobiology in which they have altered GABAergic genes and cerebral endothelial cells. This doesn't work if it's in peripheral endothelial cells, but if you alter the GABAergic genes in cerebral endothelial cells, you get a cortex and you get uh, autistic-like behavior that looks very similar to the behavior that you see in classic autism models such as Fragile X or tuberous sclerosis. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at some, we will look at evidence today from uh, our our plural <laughs> laboratories, and we'll talk about we'll talk about that. Um, and from vascular biology, one we're going to be looking at um, some indirect human evidence from vascular genes that are found in pathogenic copy number variants associated with uh, CNS symptoms and autism. 
And secondly, we're going to be looking at some genomic influences that showing the blood breakdown of the developmental neurovascular signaling uh, that impact impacts our blood brain barrier and uh, it may be function. Then finally, we'll talk about uh, some of the metals biology. Um, it's particularly relevant since the FDA recent, uh, recently came out with um, all of these measurements of high cadmium and other things in baby food, uh, which is uh, incredibly concerning. Um, my daughter, as a result, my daughter did not, in fact, in fact, feed my grandson any um, baby food that she bought <laughs> at all from the grocery store. Um, and find, and what we want to look at particularly is the data that comes from the uh, cadmium project that is uh, in neurotoxicity from our pilot grant from uh, CIEHS. All right, so um, uh, number one, let's talk about some of the autism genes that map to neural circuits. Um, this is a rather complicated figure, but basically what I want to uh, communicate is the following. We had we took um, all of the genes and the pathogenic variants from 100, 117 autism patients from the U of L Autism Center. We put it through an informatics uh, pipeline to really be able to map the uh, autism uh, the autism genes themselves on neurocircuits involved in, say, a cognition or those involved in social communication. And first, what we did was we looked at some of the pathways, uh, both through uh, KEG pathway analysis and in particular the Panther pathway analysis. And one of the things that we found very interesting was that a lot of the um, signaling pathways that were highlighted here were those that were involved in uh, vascular biology and angiogenesis. Um, and you probably can't read it there, but I'm gonna uh, read it for you. FGF signaling, T cell activation, RAS uh, activation, uh, insulin pathway, and MAP kinase activation, uh, angiogenesis. And in particular, number 11 here, which can't really read on the slide is hedgehog signaling. And we're going to be looking today at the balance of hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, and wind signaling uh, and our different models. And uh, this figure is only meant to communicate the fact that uh, when you map these vascular genes on neurocognitive circuits, they actually correlate with anxiety scores. Um, that uh, parents have actually done have actually done on uh, questionnaires that we've given them. Uh, and in fact, we used two different questionnaires. One was the Vineland questionnaire, and the other one was the Parental Concern questionnaire. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, autism genes that map on neuro, neuro circuits, which you know some of those map on to ask. Uh, vascular uh, biology actually can predict parent concerns about particular seen as symptoms in autism, which we found very interesting. So we have a lot more to do in, the, uh, in this uh, particular study, but nonetheless, it's very interesting and pointing us towards the vascular biology. And so um, today, what we want to look at is we want to look at the hypothesis that inter interrupted crosstalk between sonic hedgehog signaling and wind signaling promotes abnormal neurovascular signaling in autism-like behaviors from three different models. So um, just to remind everybody about the biology of the blood-brain barrier during development, um, this is this this is the anatomy that you normally find in uh, in us grown-ups, and that is you have the skull and then the arachnoid villi is here, and then you have the CS and then you have the CSF, and the CSF base these uh, these structures that are called the neurovascular units. The neurovascular units are made up of not only of neural innervation and astrocytes, but they're also made up of these 
specialized cells that are called pericytes. And in particular, these very active cells that form the blood-brain barrier that are called the cerebral endothelium. And uh, this figure over here on the right is just to show us once again how blood-brain barrier genesis actually occurs during the time, uh, you know, starting in the late time of cortical genesis and includes and, and can, uh, continues on during gliogenesis. And during that time, there are the, um, in the cerebral endothelial cells, there's the formation of these tight junctions and specialized transporters. And then during, develop during development, that is actually mediated by wind signaling um, that uh, uh, comes through the frizzled receptors. And then this is uh, the atrocyte produces sonic hedgehog, and that uh, signals through uh, the uh, patch uh, gene to uh, call, induce and cause differentiation, which includes the expression of these tight junctions. And the maintenance uh, during the adult years is maintained by sonic hedgehog signaling, which still has a, um, a close uh, a tie with wind signaling in adults. So this very complicated drawing here shows uh, shows us these two particular pathways. And so sonic hedgehog through patch uh, activates this uh, gene that's called smoothen. And then that uh, activates all these different uh, uh, transcription factors called GLEE, um, in particular GLEE1 actually uh, activates this gene called SFRP to inhibit wind signaling. Con concurrently, when wind signaling is active through beta-catenin uh, transcription, that actually promotes target genes that in turn then in turn activate uh, sonic hedgehog signaling. And as we'll talk about today, um, one of the uh, interesting things about uh, this crosstalk of this pathway is that it, it, it probably has a number of different uh, factors that um, essentially feed into that. For instance, uh, today we'll look at the uh, semaphore neuropillin signaling system um, and it turns out that that uh, system actually uh, if you inhibit it actually promotes the uh, phosphorylation of gsk3 beta and as a result as a result uh, you down regulate beta catenin uh, as a result you inhibit the uh, proosomal uh, degradation and you have activation of uh, the beta catenin uh, signaling, um, which can cause all of these different processes, uh, including inflammation and uh, ROS generation. This, um, this second uh, figure here is just meant to show and reinforce that through sonic hedgehog signaling, you uh, do promote the uh, increased production of I, tight junction proteins, which uh, increases barrier genesis. And you could show the same thing for wind signaling as well. So in the healthy condition, that signaling that signaling promotes um, blood-brain barrier integrity. Um, but when you have a pathologic condition, either through uh, a, a neurodevelopmental gene or environmental exposures, um, you can have uh, changes in activation of microglia and, and changes in the astrocytes such that you decrease um, signaling through, say, sonic hedgehog or wind signaling, and that makes your blood-brain barrier leaky. So let's talk about um, some of the data that we've generated over the last couple of years, and this is uh, in the semaphore neuropillin 2 signaling system. And uh, I've done this in, in close collaboration with uh, Dr. Gazelle and uh, Dr. Jengarad Pooley. Is that how we pronounce it? Probably not, but anyways, I always get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this um, 
this mouse I've been working with for a long time. It's a, uh, it, this is a family of guidance cues. They're actually expressed uh, all over the body. Um, it's uh, particularly expressed in the immune system beside the brain. Um, these, uh, these signaling systems are expressed in interneurons and pyramidal cells. They uh, control the terminal differentiation in pyramidal cells by regulating not only the, the proliferation, but also uh, regulating neurite outgrowth. Uh, inner neurons that uh, it regulates uh, cell migration and cell numbers um, and defects in that uh, signaling here through the neuropillin 2 signaling system. If you have defects, um, you develop uh, autism-like behaviors uh, and uh, the uh, patho, patho uh, the um, anatomic pathology that I talked about. Um, and you also developed uh, increased spikes on the EEG, and you developed uh, focal, focal seizures that emanate from the hippocampus and temporal lobe. So um, let's show some of our early work that we published from 2019. Uh, what we did was we uh, did a, a recombination experiment in which we either knocked out the symmetry F ligand, uh, either in excitatory cells with EMX1 Cre or DLX1 Cre. Um, we did a fairly extensive uh, anatomic and pathological set of studies, and we uh, determined that a lot of the phenotypes of the whole knockouts were actually actually found more so in the uh, GABAergic uh, knockout mouse. And so um, when we found when we found those, uh, one of our questions was, uh, what could be the uh, mechanisms of this? So we started first looking at, uh, and the other part of this is that symmetry F and neuropillin 2 signaling are very important for the migration, the differentiation of cerebral endothelial cells. So, uh, putting those two facts together, we started to look at um, some of the uh, uh, components of neuroinflammation. And what we found was that in a, gene in a genotype specific way, only in the flox flox positive Cree animals, we found uh, activation and increased number of uh, microglia. We found increased nitrosylation of uh, proteins, and we found increased uh, ROS uh, 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 generation through using the compound uh, DHE. And, um, and that was data that we published in 2019. One of the really interesting things that we've found subsequently is that we've started to look in other areas that have that have increased production of symmetry F or particularly enriched in symmetry F. And one of those areas is noted is noted here in uh, the area of the so-called cerebellum. We don't often talk about cere the cerebellum in developmental neurobiology. You can count the number of labs that actually do work in this region, probably on two hands. Um, so a lot less is known about it from a uh, basic science point of view. There is some work in the clinical areas on this as well, but um, it is, as we'll talk about it in the end, it may be a very interesting area to get into uh, for our uh, for our research program. So um, going back to the symmetry F knockout, we did the DHE standing for uh, ROS species and found that the uh, in in particular we found that the cerebral cortex uh, lit up quite nicely uh, with in the uh, knockout animal versus the wild versus the wild type. Um, so we'll get back to this a little later, and this will be a theme that we see some emerging uh, neurovascular pathology and um, some of these different uh, animal models uh, related to uh, sonic hedgehog and wind signaling. Okay, um, 
probably I'm running a little behind here, so I may go may go on. Um, but essentially, these particular these particular slides are just meant to show that we did in fact we did in fact uh, show microglial activation in a number of different brain regions, including the amygdala, hippocampus, and cortex. And we looked at the the actual uh, morphology of our uh, microglia, and what we found was they went from this sort of spindle-like structure, which is uh, noted to be uh, a more resting state structure, to a more globular structure, which is thought to be more activated. Um, so that cor that certainly correlates with all of the different inflammation that we see that we see in this model. And as a result of that, we saw a lot of leakage in a genotype specific way in the hippocampus and the cortex and the amygdala, both uh, serotonin as well as albumin. So we had, so we had generated this model that we just recently published in cells uh, in July, where that um, if you knock out the uh, symmetry of ligand, and I do wonder about if we knocked it out in the Purkinje cells, um, and I don't know if that's true or not for this particular symmetry of knockout, but Purkinje cells are cabergic in origin. But nonetheless, what you see in, in summary is microglial activation, uh, increase in in these ROS as well as nitrosylation species, you see inflammatory mediators, and then we have evidence of endothelial cell injury and platelet activation, including increased serotonin and some other signaling molecules, which I uh, won't mention right now. So, so here we have at least one model that might have um, that might have increased uh, or changes in beta catena signaling. So why are we so interested in that from a developmental disorder point of view? Well, one of the very interesting things is either hypo or hyperactivation of the wind beta catena signaling system can cause ASD pathological changes and, and behaviors. Uh, we principally have seen that in animal studies, but we've also seen that in terms of the autism genetic studies in which all of these different genes, including beta catena and APC, uh, GS, GSK3 beta, uh, all have um, uh, pathological mutations that, sh that are much greatly enriched in autism patients compared to uh, sex and uh, age match controls. So the question is, is the activation of the wind signaling system or stabilization of beta continent, does that occur in uh, not, only, not only in cadmium toxicity, but can that also occur in other models as well? Um, and one of the models that we have looked at, and this is a model that's particularly relevant to uh, Lukai, is this uh, model that's called the BTBR mouse. It's long been known as a mouse that um, is, uh, displays autism-like behaviors uh, compared to the B6 mice. But what is not as appreciated by the neurobiologist is that our diabetes uh, research and, and folks uh, uh, use this as an animal model of diabetes. Um, and nobody has ever asked the question whether the diabetes and the autism is, is related or not. Um, one of the really interesting observations that's uh, very indirect is that uh, diabetes medications in the BTBR animals can cause the autism-like behaviors to go away completely. So um, anyways, that has not been, been looked at as of, as of yet. Uh, but what we do know is that these BTBR animals, um, which we have been doing uh, research with, with Dr. Song here in the, here in the uh, Moxer Toxicology and Pharmacology Department, and his graduate student, Sheriff Schrader, uh, we, we've looked at the in, in inflammatory system and continue to look at that. 
Um, and one of the things that we found, and this is certainly uh, corroborated by other studies, is that the BTBR mice have more CD4 cells and compared to the uh, B6 mice, which is shown over here in the blood, uh, here, on, here on the right. What's very interesting is that these uh, cell numbers are actually sensitive to uh, a, a compound that actually may block immune functioning called cannabidiol. Uh, so cannabidiol, of course, is a, a compound that uh, was originally was originally used thousands of years ago for epilepsy. More recently, it's being looked at and, and subsequently we, in fact, got FDA approval for a, a medication called Epidiolax for bad seizures. Um, but it's being looked at in autism as, as well, uh, both in humans and in animal models. And so Sarah, as part of her dissertation, has looked at the BTBR mice compared to the bees, B6 mice, and she's looked at some of the autism behaviors, which uh, include this thing that's called self-grooming. Um, it's thought to be uh, a, a animal analog of the repetitive behaviors. And it, it, she was very able to nicely show compared to the vehicle that 15 mg per kg of CBD um, will uh, essentially bring back the repetitive behaviors to near uh, levels that are near B6 as well. Um, so there'll be more to come on that, hopefully later in the uh, fall semester. But nonetheless, it, um, it it does show us that, and it, and it does confirm that uh, the, inflammatory, the inflammatory phenotype may have some very close significant relationships to the autism-like behavior. And uh, of note, uh, this animal has hyperactivation of BSK, BSK3 beta, um, so it does have it does have some altered uh, wind signaling, um, and also has changes in mTOR signaling as well. So a lot more to uh, sort out with that. But nonetheless, um, what we actually found in in the um, BT BTBR animals. It's a very interesting finding, and that is that if you look at one of the type junction proteins that's very highly expressed in the uh, cerebral cort in the cerebral cortex of C57, and the BTBRs, it basically goes away. And it's really quite dramatic. I mean, and another thing that's very interesting about this is that we find um, essentially the these uh, deep cerebellar nuclei neurons have accumulations of, of this type of protein in the cytoplasm itself. Now, why that's interesting is that there have been previous reports that inflammation actually causes removal of ZO1 from the uh, surface of cerebral endothelial cells and other cells, and it actually causes it to accumulate in the cytoplasm. So that's really, it's very, very interesting. Um, but we certainly don't see it in the vascular components here, that's for sure. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's a very interesting finding that we had here with the BTBRs. And that correlates actually with, if you look in the BTBRs with the uh, DHE staining, the essentially the cerebral cortex, the Purkinje cells, as well as the deep uh, cerebral nuclei light up like a light uh, with ROS species or apparent ROS species compared to the C57 black six. So really quite interesting and other certainly uh, more evidence that there might be uh, neuroinflammation going on here. And this is just to show that the uh, ROS that we uh, species we find that's increased in BTBR is not only increased in cerebellum, but also increased in the cortex, amygdala, and the hippocampus. And um, this just shows that just like just like the semaphore mice, that there is increased uh, albumin as well that we find accumulated in uh, in neurons and the BTBRs, but not in C57 black six. And you can quantitate that, and and it shows um, it it shows in all particular areas with a statistically significant elevation.
So what we have here is we have uh, two different mice that um, are and that may be connected by uh, increase uh, increase slash altered wind signaling that display autism like behaviors. Um, and they seem to have this inflammatory state that's uh, associated with an increase in phospho GSK3 beta, uh, possibly increasing the signaling. Um, and they also have these, uh, at least neuropathological phenomena of decreased tight junction proteins, ROS production, and blood brain barrier leakage. Um, so it suggests that the crosstalk between Sonic Hedgehog and the wind signaling is uh, quite altered. And I did not state, but Sonic Hedgehog, one of the target genes downstream is semaphore and 3 f and neuropillin 2. So, um, you know, in looking at, so uh, if genomic factors or diabetic factors can influence brain signaling and cause ROS, uh, cause autism-like behaviors, um, can we also find that and some environmental uh, influences that are of interest to the group. So let's talk about heavy meadows and obesity as risk factors for developmental uh, for developmental disorders and autism. Um, so prenatal and postnatal exposures of heavy metals can cause neurotoxicity and neurological defects. Certainly, the exposure in animals uh, lead to an increased risk of ADSD-like behaviors. We talked about the baby food uh, before, uh, well over the minimum requirement limits. And uh, on top of all, on top of all of this, we have an increasing trend of obesity in children, and this is particularly bad in the autism population. By the time you're 18, 100% um, of the adults report that they're over, at least overweight. And many of them are significantly overweight. Um, and as you will see, it certainly um, can in fact, and can in fact um, change uh, different types of neural circuits if you're, over, if you're overweight. In fact, um, I remember a seminar that we saw several years ago looking at just feeding, uh, feeding high fat diets alone that led to deficits in uh, social circuits that are in mice that are relevant to autism. So uh, let's take a look at that in, in more detail. Um, and we talked about the epidemiologic associations of postnatal uh, cadmium exposure and ASD. Um, and there's certainly a tight, ex a tight association with ASD, gestational diabetes, and, and uh, the development uh, of autism. So, so in rodents, these perinatal low-dose exposure affects learning and memory and anxiety-like behaviors. Uh, postnatal, uh, postnatal dosing can impair uh, hippocampal spatial learning. And then finally, uh, things as we talked about, uh, you know, like the high fat diet can affect dopamine uh, metabolism, can, ca can cause these different types of autism like behaviors, as well as social behavior deficits, uh, as well as learning and memory deficits in wild type mice, and they can exacerbate autism like behaviors in the BTBR models. So the question is, uh, or is that related to wind signaling or not? So we don't have any direct evidence in our other two models, but let's take a look at this model. Okay, um, so first off, uh, all credit uh, to looking at this model goes to Jun Kai and his laboratory with some uh, with some help from Lou. Yes, sorry, sorry about that, Lou. Um, and so there are two different models that uh, Jun Kai has been looking at. One is an in, in utero and pre-weaning exposure model in which you acclimatize the mice, you expose them to cadmium uh, pre-conception, and then you uh, and and then um, the exposure goes on, um, and then they're then they're finally tested. The post-weaning exposure um, starts, I believe, at what uh, this is at weaning, yeah. Um, and then goes on goes on in the drinking water for uh, to six months of age. Um, 
And what we found uh, essentially is that um, there is uh, increased cambium uh, in different parts of the brain. Um, it shows the different conditions here, and basically the only two conditions that are really relevant here are the um, are these light peak lines and these red lines here. The uh, light pink is cadmium at five parts per million with a normal diet, and then the uh, red is the cadmium at five parts per million plus high fat diet. So as you can see here on the graph on the left, um, there's a dramatic accumulation in, in the in five parts per million in the cortex and the hippocampus. But in particular, there's something really quite interesting going on about the cerebellum. This is the area that we found the most uh, cadmium in. And um, obviously that uh, and raises my raises my ears uh, and uh, as we look at this data. Um, one of the things that he looked at was uh, DNA oxidation uh, in these different groups. And what he did find, and is shown here in these micrographs, is that both in the five parts per million of cadmium and high fat diet can induce DNA oxidation in the cortex and in the hippocampus, and the high fat diet can in, in can enhance that. Um, what was a interesting was, despite the fact that cadmium can do this and in other areas, neither the cadmium for the high fat diet induced DNA oxidation in the cerebellum. Um, that could be due to exposure phenomena, exposure phenomena, et cetera. So I think we're going back and looking at some uh, longer exposure models in order to uh, look at uh, look at that a bit further. Um, in the hippocampus, um, high fat diet dramatically increased the cadmium oxidation in the pyramidal cells uh, within the hippocampal subregions, and the uh, zero point five uh, cadmium exposure uh, did not uh, cause DNA oxidation. Um, likewise, we did um, we did find that both the high fat diet and the cadmium can activate microglia and astrocytes in the cortex and and hippocampus, but not again in the cerebellum. And the high fat diet significantly uh, significantly influenced that, and we did not see those changes at zero point five ppm cadmium. Now. Um, Speaking of looking at uh, inflammation and wind signaling, um, we did a, uh, or uh, Jim Kai's lab did a uh, number of different uh, experiments. First off, uh, we looked at the messenger RNA of TNF alpha and IL 10, so two of the cytokines in the cortex, to either exposed to cadmium or and or high fat diet. And what we found is we did find an did find an elevation, and that is particularly true uh, in in the cadmium five parts per million. Uh, we found that and um, with both markers, and the high fat diet seemed to attenuate that, uh, which I thought was uh, interesting and kind of, from my standpoint, unexpected. Um, Another thing that we did uh, find is that we found that the blood-brain barrier uh, integrity is measured by the albumin that we that we find in the brain uh, cortex uh, was disrupted, and those exposed to cadmium five parts per million or a high-fat diet, um, and it was certainly more uh, severely disrupted when you had both. Um, and you didn't see that at the 0 0.5 parts per million. Now, uh, we did, we've done, uh, we've been able to look at some ASD relevant behaviors. Um, this data as a whole um, was looking at uh, the three chamber tests, which is a, uh, which is a uh, test of sociability uh, that involves the prefrontal cortex. And we found no uh, impacts of either cadmium or high fat diet uh, exposure on social, so-called social preference. So social preference 
is this uh, uh, this condition here in which you ask the mouse to choose between a stranger mouse and an inanimate object and a normal mouse will choose a would choose the stranger mouse the uh, slash novel mouse a autistic mouse would choose the inanimate object so we didn't see that here but what we did see was that there was this uh, deference, uh, deficits in so-called social novelty and that is that if a mouse is familiar with one uh, familiar with one a mouse and then you put in a novel unfamiliar mouse uh, normally the mouse will uh, will gravitate towards the unfamiliar mouse uh, but in this kit but in this case those fit cadmium but not how it could die and had the defect where they spent uh, more time with the familiar mouse so I had a p-value of 0.0184 so um, so there are some social defects. Um, we also looked at uh, repetitive behaviors. Um, there was a, there was not an impact on the repetitive behaviors as measured by the marble bearing test. Uh, other other than the diet seemed to decrease the amount of marbles that they buried. Um, but what we did find was we did find with the uh, chemian conditions, both with and without high fat diet, that there was increased repetitive grooming. So it's that same sort of repetitive behaviors that I was talking about, where the mice just repetitively uh, groom their head till they're literally bald most times uh, compared to the uh, control condition. So, and um, the other thing that was found was that mice fed cadmium and or the high fat diet traveled a shorter distance. So, um, again, uh, it, we're questioned about whether when signaling in these uh, models is altered. And let's take a look at some of that data. So first off, we looked at some of the messenger RNA for the uh, uh, so-called core, uh, some of the core proteins in the in the pathway, um, and we didn't see an effect of cadmium, but we did see an uh, effect of the diet for the messenger RNA. Likewise, if you look at the messenger RNA for beta catenin and GSK three K beta at the RNA level. There wasn't much of an impact of cadmium, it's, uh, but there was an impact of the diet. But however, when you look at the protein level, and this is a good teaching point for the students, RNA is not protein, it's not the business end. And what we did find is we did find a calcium, uh, a, sorry, a cadmium uh, induced dose dependent accumulation of both active beta catenin and the phosphorylation of GS3K beta. So there was altered uh, signaling within and with preliminary evidence here at five parts, uh, certainly at five parts per million. So concluding here, we have the uh, whole life cadmium exposure uh, can cause DNA oxidative stress, glial activation, inflammatory response, impaired blood brain barrier. Um, those that are fed with cadmium and high fat diet do show some rel ASD relevant behavioral defects. And it appears that the wind beta continuing signaling is, is disturbed. So the bottom line from our human data and, uh, and our animal data uh, of the emerging pathology is that, you know, we've long known that environmental causes may impact neural circuits. The data from our human genetic experiments, metal experiments, and gene manipulation suggests the hypothesis that uh, changes in neurovascular biology during development may impact gabergic differentiation um, uh, maladaptive formation of neural circuits and expression of autism-like behavior. Um, I'm really not going to, and I don't have time to really talk about our cerebellum uh, hypothesis, but the bottom line, the bottom line from that is, is that the cerebellum uh, 
what it does in life is that it coordinates communication between brain regions through neural circuits that go from the cerebellum to the neo neocortex. Um, and it does that by essentially uh, augmenting the so-called coherence. Now, what is coherence? Um, well, that is essentially the uh, EG power that you that you measure between brain regions. And it's a measure of the synchrony essentially between brain regions. And brain regions, when they have a particular task, need to be in synchrony in order for you in order for you to actually be able to uh, do that task. So uh, the cerebellar output has to be appropriate to promote Bernard's synchrony uh, between task appropriate cerebral cortical regions. And question finally is how can we take clinically available data and uh, put this in an uh, artificial intelligence model, including the cadmium or metals data to be able to not only diagnose autism, but predict treatment responses. So uh, getting to our future uh, planned experiments. Um, Number one, um, from the laboratory June Kai, the other things that they have seen is they've had seen some epigenetic changes that were detected in the mouse brain of those exposed to 0 0.5. I don't know if we've looked at the five yet, um, but the preliminary data also says that long-term parental exposure of cadmium can induce more severe epigenetic uh, alterations in the odd in the mouse, uh, in the offspring mouse brain. Um, and so there are plans uh, for a grant to look at uh, when beta continuous signaling, now uh, behavioral deficits in a, uh, in I think a somewhat refined uh, whole life cadmium exposure model in postnatal obesity. Um, second, and secondly, I think that uh, our laboratories Dr. Gazelle's and I's laboratory. We should discuss two different projects and maybe in, con um, in collaboration with Dr. Kai and Dr. Um, Song. One is a project that would involve looking at wind signaling behavioral defects in the BDPR mouse, its relationship to gestational blood glucose and potential reversal by diabetes medications. And then the second one it's for us to look at uh, whether the uh, wind biology uh, in the defective uh, simbiform mouse with behavioral defects, can that be reversed by wind inhibitors, which include you know, some common drugs that we, that we use in practice. Uh, metformin is one of them. There are a, a, a couple of other diabetes medicines that use that. There's also a neurology drug that's called Rizolol, um, that can also that can may also be a good wind inhibitor that's currently on the market. So we'll test those in this model as well. So thanks, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, sorry I had too much here, and uh, I'll take any questions. And by the way, thanks to all my collaborators. <laughs>